Okay, what if you're trying to get some kind of index number? So you want an incremental count or something going up. And normally outside of a tab, you might do something like, you know, put one in your first row and then just sort of have it, you know, each formula says equals the one above plus one, for example, it could be plus two. And that goes, you know, all the way down. So you've got a nice sequential count. What if you put new data on that? And effectively nothing happens and you have to then drag that formula down. So how can you get around that and stop having to drag the formula down? So I'll just get rid of that new data again. Because I've actually got three different ways that you can do this. Uh, the first two are sort of a kind of personal preference kind of thing. But the next one, the third one, has got a lot more flexibility and you could do a lot more than just a straight incremental count and index. So let me just show you the first one then. So the first one we're going to use is the rows function. So rows, it just counts the number of rows in an array, so a range of cells. And the great thing about sort of tables and things like that is that it doesn't matter if you count your um, current cell. It doesn't generate any kind of circular reference. So if we count from the header, and then we need to put a colon in here, so we're going to count from the header to the current cell, and hit enter, we get a formula that goes all the way down, and you can see obviously it's going to start at two, so it's two rows. All I need to do to make that start at one is put a minus one on the end of that formula, and we've got our incremental count. And because it's the same function all the way down, it will auto-populate, which I'll show you in a minute. Second one, just personal preference. This is the one I tend to use when I'm doing that kind of thing. And this one, I will just say that I want the row function, which is the row of like one particular reference. So I'll say the row of the current cell, so its own row number, and I'll just deduct the row number of the header function which because that has its own table notation, it'll always be the header. So it'll always tell you which row you're in. And so you'll get exactly the same kind of result as you would with that, um, but it's just a slightly different way of doing it. Both of them, in incidentally, it doesn't matter if you insert rows, this will all work because it's within, it's relative to the table position. So inserting columns and rows is not really going to affect these numbers. So let's just get rid of those. And the third way that you might want to generate something like this is with an offset function. And this has some additional flexibility as I alluded to before. So let's just set off with the offset function in case you haven't used it before. Now incidentally, all of these functions are on my 30 free fantastic functions cheat sheet, which is available for free with the download link in the description. So get your hands on that, the only 33 essential functions in Excel, in my opinion. Okay, so the offset function then allows you to move from a particular position by a certain number of rows and columns, and also gives you the option to sort of expand that range. You can pick any range relative to any other range. So of course, I'm gonna say, I want to start at my current cell on this, and the number of rows I'm going to say are going to go minus one, so I'm going to go up a row. I don't want to move any columns. And height and width are optional. Um, they default to just one cell, so we'll leave it like that. And when I hit that, every row there says offset function. This one's saying I want what's in the header, that one's saying I want the row above, that one's saying I want the row above that, etc. So it doesn't really do anything as it stands. But what I can do is detect where I'm in the first row and put that as a one. So let's just to do, do that. So we use it in conjunction with the row function. So if the row function equals one, so now we have a start number that we can put in. So if it's row one, what do we want it to start on? So let's start it at say a thousand for the moment because we know we've got uh, several thousand rows of data. If the row is one, we start at a thousand. Otherwise, we take the row above and let's just add one to the number, okay? And so now we get a number starting at a thousand and going up by one. And of course, we could say that we want it going up by in twos, 
or any other kind of combination of things there or any other start position. So we've got something that's a lot more flexible and we can even sort of multiply it by the number above or, or create any kind of sequence that we desire using that kind of technique. So let's go back to one. So do they work? Well, let's try and add the new data and see what we get. So here's the new data. I'm going to add it on at the bottom of this. So I'll just go down to the bottom here and add it on. And as you can see, this index, original index breaks, but these ones all carry on doing exactly what we hope they do. So these incrementing by one, this is obviously going to be a thousand higher than that because it starts at a thousand. But I don't know if you've spotted, there's a potential issue with this. And that is if you sort this data in a complete different order, well, for a start, the original one messes up, but the new ones that I've added still start at one and go down. So these numbers are in no way attached to the actual data. But there is a fix for this, and I'll tell you about it right now. Okay, so we've got our table, we've got our new functions on that index things and start at different positions. And now we want to get it so that when we um, put in new data, these uh, the allocated numbers that are here are retained. So one way we could do that is to essentially treat this as some kind of input table that we do not sort and filter. And we have a duplicate table that's just the values and we can sort and filter that to our heart's content and use it in reports and stuff. And the perfect tool for the job of doing that in an automated way is Power Query. So I'll show you how to do that now because it's very simple. Go to the data menu, and as long as you're in the table, you can hit from table range, and this will put it in to here straight away. Now I'm not gonna do anything to this other than on the drop down menu for close and load, hit close and load two, and I'm gonna say that I want it in a table, and it just so happens I'm gonna put it in an existing worksheet here. So table and an existing worksheet. If I go over to this worksheet now, that's been put in there. And I just might need to do a bit of, you know, formatting of numbers or something because I didn't do it in Power Query. So that's formatted as a day and that one as a number. But now what we've got is these numbers and these are no longer functions or formulas. These are literally just the numbers that I allocated to that data. So when I sort it, for example, these numbers come with it and they're now effectively reference numbers. Okay, but what about the new data? Well, this is the beauty of Power Query, of course, is that you can take this new data, can add it back on our input sheet on the bottom. These numbers auto-generate and then I can go back to here and if I refresh this data, all the new stuff comes in and I've got my new reference numbers, the original reference numbers, have not changed. So if I was using them elsewhere, they would still refer to the right data. So that's how you can retain the same sort orders and references. Hopefully that was useful, save you a bit of time generating automatic references for your data and save you having to do a whole load of copy and pasting every time new data is coming in. If you want to save more time in Excel, hit that subscribe button and the bell icon and I will see you in the next video shortly.